Hey, welcome to Herb Corner, where we'll be discussing the blunt-headed burrowing frog, also known as Glyphoglossus molossus, the trunket-snouted burrowing frog, or the balloon frog. Now, in terms of body shape, they're very round. They're part of the family Microhylidae, which is a family of fat, round, narrow-mouthed frogs. Typically, the members of the family are rather small. Most are a little smaller than half an inch. According to, and I'm sorry if I'm citing this wrong, a conference paper done by Nariswan University, the minimum size of an adult is roughly 1.3 inches or 35 millimeters from their snout to their cloaca. A cloaca is the vent that a reptile, amphibian, bird, and the like uses to house its genitalia. Now, that may seem strange considering they look a lot bigger than that in some pictures. That's because, much like in the intro, they're able to puff up to roughly twice their size. That's why they're so huge in so many images, but more normal looking in others. The speculated purpose, who is speculating? Me! Is to make them look like a larger animal to ward off predators. A rather common defense mechanism similar to puffer fish and puff adders. Though it's important to note that puff adders inflate using their singular lung and puffer fish use their spines to look less appetizing. Another possible reason is to impress the females of the species during mating. So considering how many other frogs puff up as a defense mechanism, that's less likely. They're often confused for the Mexican burrowing toad for their flat noses, but also sometimes confused for the turtle frog for their dumpy anatomy. Funny thing is, they're not even in the same family. The blunt-headed burrowing frog has a thick chin with small eyes that bug out of their head. They've also got tiny little skink arms that hold them up similarly to a bushveld brain frog. The frog is mostly brown with a light-colored underbelly. Not to be confused with the Mexican burrowing toads, which have bright orange speckles, while blunt-headed burrowing frogs do not. The blunt-headed burrowing frog was discovered in 1868 by Albert Gunther, a German-British zoologist, ichthyologist, and, most interestingly, the second most productive herpetologist in what he contributed, the blunt-headed burrowing frog being one of the 340 species he's discovered. They're found in Thailand, Cambodia, Myanmar, Laos, and Vietnam, mostly in moist tropical forests, marshes, and ponds. Much like the Indian purple frog, they spend a majority of the time under the soil until it rains, where there's explosions of eggs and breeding. Quite literally, they're judged by the IUCN Red List as near-threatened, with a trend of their population decreasing. Most of what's threatening their numbers are deforestation and being hunted. The fact that they're hunted is due to them being considered a Thai delicacy. They're prevalent in Thai barbecue, often mislabeled as bullfrogs. However, to combat this, Fao Inland Fisheries Research and Development Center uh, started a breeding project with five total frogs to breed and release the offspring into the wild. There's a few pages written in English which makes for an interesting read. A majority is in Thai though, so if you speak Thai, I'd thoroughly recommend it. For the blunt-headed burrowing frog, the carrier would be about as simple as a bullfrog, just scaled down. The enclosure size should be around a 20 gallon, long, with half of it blocked off for water. For inspiration, I'd recommend the YouTube person Afro Herp Keeper's bullfrog enclosure. He uses a small glass pane to separate the water from the dirt. The water not only adds to the enclosure's humidity, but also provides space to swim. His video on it goes in depth on what he uses. I'd recommend it for any frog with a similar anatomical build that requires similar care. The typical loose substrate of dirt with some kind of drainage layer underneath to prevent moisture buildup. Some kind of plant would be good, even if it's a fake one. A tub would work instead of a glass enclosure, but that'd make it harder for plants to get appropriate lighting. Tubs are useful for maintaining high humidity and low visibility, but that's about it. Currently, I don't have any experience with using tubs for enclosures, so I don't have much to weigh in with. For the blunt-headed burrowing frog, they'll be covered in dirt a majority of the time, so the only hiding spot they'll need other than the dirt itself would be some leaves. And of course, since the blunt-headed burrowing frog is an amphibian, it's important to pay attention to the type of water you give them. They're incredibly sensitive to the chlorine and fluoride we put in the tap, so for their safety, the best thing to do is filter it out. That, or stick to drinking water. If you give them tap water, it always applies Zoomed Reptisafe, or any other water purifier. With that said, it's good to mist the enclosure twice a day with dechlorinated water, just to moderate the enclosure's humidity. The diet is similar to most other frogs their size. Any animal that's small enough to fit in their mouth, they'll gladly eat. The best diet for them would be dubia roaches, frozen thud pinkies, and the occasional waxworm, or hornworm. 
all of which dusted with reptocalcium. A heat lamp with a basking area of 80 degrees Fahrenheit would be good, but not necessary. This is mainly for the extra enrichment of a temperature gradient, or if it's particularly cold. But keep in mind that in the wild, they flourish during rainy seasons, so even if temperature drops excessively low, they'll probably be fine, just so long as it's not snowing in your house. Handling is of course a bad idea for the species considering they're an amphibian. Amphibians breathe through their skin, so the oils and dirt we have on ours can clog their pores and be almost deadly. If handling is absolutely necessary, then try to limit handling to, at most, 10 minute intervals. Aside from that, use gloves. With gloves, they make for a great animal to handle, since they'll just hang out on your hand for a while. This is a common thing with terrestrial frogs as a whole. Terrestrial means they're primarily on land. With fat terrestrial frogs, they don't move a whole lot, and the likelihood of them jumping out of your hand is very low. They're probably not going to be at risk for them biting you, since they generally just don't. Even if they do, it's not like their mouth is particularly dangerous. At the date of this video, there is no, to my knowledge at least, captive breeding for this animal, or at least captive breeding for selling. Yes, the FAO Inland Fisheries Research and Development Center is breeding them, but they're not for public buying, only for increasing the wild population. Breeding for this species would be harder than most reptiles, considering they have a tadpole stage. There's very little sexual dimorphism in this species, if any. Sexual dimorphism is when the males look different from the females. It might be that the females generally have less saturated colors, but that's an unreliable way to judge. Either way, the way to go about breeding this species safely can go as follows. Take the female out of her separate enclosure and introduce her to the male. Based on this video by Wildside Photography, the female then produces eggs instantly. Then, after they procreate, give them a minute or two. Then, take the female and put her back in her original enclosure. It's important in this process to keep the male in his enclosure, in case the species is territorial, which I can't say much about due to the lack of research in that area. Move the male out of the way, this means either putting him in a temporary enclosure, or simply putting him in the land section of the enclosure. Then, with some kind of cup, glass or plastic is fine, scoop the eggs and transfer them into an aquarium of any kind. Keep a close eye on their metamorphosis, since it'll be important to move them to land enclosures when they can walk. It's good to note that the amount of eggs they lay in a clutch is... Uh, uncountable? In a single breeding session, they'll expel multiple explosions of eggs. Some frog juveniles cannibalize the others in their clutch, so that may be the same for this species. If so, there'll be moderation for the babies you get out of it, since housing all hundreds of those frogs separately is undesirable, to say the least. Though, that is under the impression that you can't cohabitate juveniles. Cohabitation is housing multiple animals together. Cohabitation is generally not safe for most species due to most species being territorial. There's little information about blunt-headed burrowing frogs behaving that way. In this species' level of availability, I'd only recommend them to experienced keepers whose main intent is breeding. Generally, I'd only recommend a species to the average keeper if captive bred animals of it are available, which, for this animal, is definitely not the case. All around, this species, although not at all prevalent in the reptile trade, would make for an excellent amphibian. They're comparable to a Pac-Man frog or a bullfrog in temperament and care, which means they're an awesome amphibian to say the least. That's all for this installment of Herb Corner. As always, sources will be in the description. Have a good evening, morning, or afternoon. Thank you for listening, watching, whatever, and I'll see you next time.